Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Snyder, president of Case Western Reserve University, and it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you today for a remarkable event in the life of our university. That is our inaugural Power of Diversity lecture series. As many of you know, in 2008, Case Western Reserve identified diversity as a core value in our strategic plan. And one of the first steps that we took in advancing this priority was the creation of a cabinet level position focused squarely on this value. So in January of 2009, Dr. Marilyn Mobley became the university's inaugural Vice President for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity. We were fortunate to find someone of her caliber, and of course I say that in part because she earned her PhD in English from Case Western Reserve University and went on to a wonderful career as a scholar of Toni Morrison, as a talented academic administrator, and as an advocate and consultant for diversity initiatives. She has described her mission as promoting inclusive thinking, mindful learning, and transformative dialogue. And Marilyn, I think we can say that's happening today on our campus. Our interim dean of the law school, Bob Rawson, is going to introduce our speaker in just a moment. But before he does, I want you to know what Professor Ogletree has been doing since he arrived on the campus of Case Western Reserve University earlier today. He met with faculty and staff who work on issues of diversity on our campus. He met with our law students and had an open forum session where they asked questions and had a dialogue, and a vigorous dialogue, I understand. And he then sat down with the leaders of our Social Justice Alliance to discuss their work within the university and to talk about projects in the broader community. So we barely gave him a few minutes, but we did give him a few minutes to catch his breath before he came to give this lecture. But it is fair to describe his visit to Case Western Reserve as a whirlwind tour. On behalf of everyone on our campus, I want to thank Professor Ogletree for being such a gracious guest. And I also want to thank KeyBank for serving as our corporate sponsor and recognize our great friend Dominic Ozan, who helped make this happen. So thank you so much, Dominic, for your role in bringing Professor Ogletree to our campus. You are a gem. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce the interim dean of the School of Law, a Rhodes Scholar, a Princeton graduate, a Harvard Law graduate, a former partner in charge of the Jones Day Law Firm, and a great leader, Bob Rawson. Thank you, Barbara, more than I expected. Uh, I am delighted to have the opportunity to welcome all of you, to add my welcome to Barbara's, and to have the honor of introducing our speaker today. Uh, Charles Ogletree is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Stanford University in, in political science. He also has a master's from, uh, from Stanford. He went on to Harvard Law School where he got his degree. And since then, of course, he has become a pillar of strength on the faculty of the Harvard Law School, where he is the Jesse Clemenko Professor of Law and also the founding and executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. And in the name of that institute really is a summary, I think a fair summary, of the scholarly interests of Professor Ogletree. Those interests can be summed up by describing them as constitutional rights for all, the definition of those rights and determining how it is we can secure those rights for everyone. But to describe those as his scholarly interests uh, is really insufficient. It's not fair. What these interests are, what these, this subject matter is, is the focus of his life as a teacher, as a writer, and as a commentator. Uh, so he writes and he studies matters such as the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education, the recent arrest of Skip Gates, and the broader consequences and meaning of that. And for those of you who are wise consumers, you'll find a book, his book on the subject right outside. And he also has written on the Rodney King investigation. And I'm giving you just some examples of the kind of writing that Professor Ogletree has done. In short, he, he studies and he writes on matters at the intersection of law, justice, and equality, both in theory and in application. You might, be descri you might, be descri might describe him, and he's known nationally, as a public in intellectual. Now, what do I mean by that? 
I don't mean just that he is a celebrity, though in some respects he is because he is a recognizable person uh, on these subjects. But he has prominence not because of some things you might associate with celebrity, but because of the power of his thinking um, and of his ideas. When events require a sensitive interpretation, when things happen in our society that require that there be a responsible legal analysis. Fortunately for the rest of us, those powers in the media tend to turn to Professor Ogletree. So that those of us who have confidence in his judgment, when we find his byline uh, in the print media or his visage on the tube, we can feel some comfort that what we're about to hear is a sensible interpretation of the difficult subjects of which he would almost inevitably be addressing. So we are blessed to have on our campus today a person of his intellect, a person who contributes importantly, very importantly, to the content and the quality of the national conversation that we have on the subjects of diversity and race. He's going to talk to us today about on the subject of why diversity matters in the Obama era. It is my honor to introduce to you a man known, as I now understand from earlier conversations, as tree to his friends. Professor Charles Ogletree. <clears throat> President Schneider and uh, uh, Dean Rawson, thank you so much for the very uh, generous int introductions and thanks for the opportunity to speak here uh, in Cleveland at Case Western. And thanks to all of my friends, a lot of uh, people who I know or hear. And I'm also happy to see some of my enemies. Uh, welcome. Uh, um, <laughs> Let me just say before I uh, talk more seriously, I'm, I'm not going to do the PowerPoint because of some uh, technical issues, but I, I want to talk about this issue of diversity. But I want to say this as a, at the beginning. Uh, I, I come to uh, a Cleveland with a particularly uh, heavy heart uh, for a number of reasons. The first is that uh, John Bustamani, who was funeral Lyles yesterday, was a mentor of mine. Uh, he was a Harvard Law graduate, the class of 1954, a remarkable gentleman uh, who always looked out for others who did incredible work. Uh, and I know, I know he would have been here, uh, and his spirit is here, and I hope that uh, the city of Cleveland and the state of Ohio and the country of America will appreciate the lasting contributions he has made and continues to make uh, on the issues of diversity and opportunity. And at the same time, I'm also uh, saddened to be back here uh, uh, after the tragic death of Congresswoman uh, Stephanie uh, Tubbs-Jones, who was also a great friend uh, and who worked very hard uh, for this community. Uh, and my classmate, Dominic Ozan, told me the moment that she had fallen ill, what had happened. And she really was a fierce warrior, uh, someone who did a great uh, a deal of service to the community. And I said you've lost some great giants. And I, I think that's important to uh, acknowledge uh, here in the uh, city of Cleveland. Uh, and at the same time, I'm very happy to have uh, uh, two dear friends. One is Dominic Lozan, who was introduced before. He was my uh, classmate. Uh, and it's great to see his, his wife and his daughter. Uh, Monique actually worked for me at the Institute uh, a, couple, a few summers ago. Uh, and uh, to tell you what kind of friend he was, uh, Dominic gave me the name Tree. <laughs> now, I want to be clear about that. People had called me Tree, but he said, how could you as an African American run for the national president of Boston, the black law students? Your name's not Jones, Washington, Williams, Henderson, it's Ogletree. What kind of slave name is Ogletree, right? <laughs> Uh, and so he, he uh, helped draft my uh, uh, platform, and I ran against great opposition. Uh, uh, and the convention was here in Cleveland. And I told Dominic I was coming. I didn't tell him I was bringing my wife and my newborn son. And he hadn't told his parents that I was bringing my wife and my newborn son. But the Ozans hosted us uh, for a wonderful uh, weekend. And I was elected, uh, despite the name Ogletree. They only know me as Tree, but I was elected. And we have been friends for decades, uh, since the uh, early uh, 1970s. And finally, uh, a very special uh, salute to my mentor, uh, and, and that's Congressman Lewis Stokes. And I say that because you know him, he's represented you, you know all he's done for Ohio and Cleveland, but let me tell you what he did for me. I didn't know him. I didn't know him. I'm in minding my own business, first year law student, criminal law, reading this case, Terry versus Ohio. And I'm just frustrated because the case talks at, none at all about race. 
I'm saying something's wrong with this. A police officer says they mumbled something. They didn't seem to belong here. I said, this case is about race, but it's not in the doctrine. And so me being the inquisitive 1L, first year law student, I go to the library. I find all the briefs, all the records, and I see the name of Lewis Stokes, uh, who had argued this case before the uh, Ohio Supreme Court, and then it made it to the Supreme Court, uh, US Supreme Court. And I'm trying to reach him. I said, you know, Congressman Stokes, you don't know me. I'm a student at Harvard Law School. And he ignored me for 10 years, all right? <laughs> And then I said, Congressman, I think you know me. I'm a tenured professor at Harvard Law School. I'd like you to come discuss the Ter Terry case. He ignored me for another 10 years, right? <laughs> but 25 years to the day, <laughs> he came uh, and gave a remarkable address. Uh, and that's what people don't know. He's not just a great congressman, but he has been involved in these issues of diversity, equity, and justice from the beginning. He and his brother, Carl Stokes, I mean, and that's, what a legend is. And the people of Cleveland and the people of Ohio should be very pleased that in your midst, in your midst today, is a giant, Congressman Lewis Stokes. And, and now I have the uh, opportunity to talk about why diversity matters uh, in the uh, Obama era. There are two possibilities. I can give you one speech and say, it really doesn't. Thank you. Goodbye. Right? Or I can give you a little bit more. And I think you want a little bit more. And I, I want to talk about this because I have been blessed. I mean, truly blessed, uh, growing up with uh, two parents, neither of who finished high school, being able to go to a place like Stanford University and graduated Phi Beta Kappa, go to Harvard Law School, be a tenured member of the faculty. I've been blessed. Two wonderful children and a wonderful wife. We just celebrated 35 years of marriage and, and three grandchildren, who I'll say more about, about Obama in just a minute. And why is that all important? Because uh, when I met uh, Michelle Obama, that's the first year I started teaching full-time at Harvard, it's 1985. She was a first-year law student. She was one of the most deeply involved and committed persons in public service. She worked for the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, represented poor clients who couldn't afford lawyers. Uh, she dressed as clean then as she does now. Uh, uh, but she was a remarkable and effective advocate uh, on behalf of her client. And my assessment, if you ask me what did I think about Michelle uh, when she graduated in 1988, I would tell you, I was convinced that Michelle was going to be the first African-American woman to serve as a senator. She had that kind of talent. She didn't go that direction, but that was my sense. She graduated in 1988 uh, and uh, came back to Chicago, her home. Uh, and Barack came in the fall of 1988. They never met at Harvard. Uh, and he came. He was the smartest kid in the room, uh, bar none. And as a professor, that's a challenge because you want to keep asking questions and not giving answers, right? I mean, that's what we get paid for, good questions, not good answers, good questions. But he was a, a dominant force in the classroom because he did something very unusual, which talks about his thinking about diversity. He not only made his point of view in a classroom, but what he did in, 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 a, in a way that was seamless, he brought every other voice into the conversation. That is what Sarah made a good point earlier, Professor Ogletree, when she said, and I think Rob was close to the mark when he said, that it wasn't about him. It was about the people around him. And you can see from the beginning that he understood that I'm here, but I'm part of a larger mission uh, to talk about diversity and make sure that everybody who's here's voice is respected without regard to their gender, their race, their religion, their class, or their ideology. It was really remarkable to see him do that. And, and he was so smart, and, and he was smart in another way. He, was, he had smarts in terms of intelligence. He also had street smarts. I won't tell you the sort of language he used on the basketball court, but believe me, he had street cred, right? <laughs> right? He may not have been fast enough or tall enough or big enough, but he had cred. He knew what to say, uh, even if he couldn't do it, uh, to make a, an important difference in, 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 in that community. Uh, and I tried not to say this publicly, but I was so impressed with Barack when he graduated. I was convinced uh, that Barack was going to be the best mayor in the history of America. Now, when I tell him that, I said, Tree, why do you say mayor, man? I, well, because I didn't see him as ideological. 
I didn't see him as political, but someone who would solve whatever problem came before him without ever expecting anything, a genuine servant of, of the people. I'm not one of those who say, I knew he was going to be president. I knew he was going to be smart and run great things. I'm glad that he's done what he's done. Uh, and uh, when you talk about diversity, it's amazing. Let me give you a little sense about Barack Obama, and I, I, you don't need to see all the slides. But if you go back and look at the book Dreams from My Father, who is the source of his understanding about diversity? It's not his father, the African from Kenya. He met his father and spent time with his father once. It is his mother, white mother from Kansas. She was the one, she says, you may have my eyebrows, but you have your father's brain. She talked about Portier. She talked about Dr. King. She talked about civil rights. And as a kid, he was saying, Ma, why are you always talking about that? But she was trying to prepare him as a black man, in her view, to live with the challenges of the 21st century. She taught him it matters. It's going to make a difference. You should know your history. Because if not, you're going to be forced to repeat it. You're doomed to repeat it. And that became a remarkable uh, uh, fact of him remembering uh, what that meant, meant. And you can see sprinkled throughout his career the idea that diversity was important. When he was a state senator, the things he did uh, on diversity, uh, uh, opportunity for education, uh, pushing to make sure that there is more health care. He pushed for health care as a state senator. Uh, he was someone who he talked about the issue of racial profiling, which I'll talk about later. Those were issues important to him uh, when he did that. But it's not a surprise that he came to that conclusion. Uh, when Barack was about to leave uh, Harvard Law School in 1991, having been elected the first black president of the Law Review, uh, having uh, the opportunity to work for any law firm in the nation to make $100,000 a year, had the opportunity to clerk for the Supreme Court, he came to me and said, Tree, I'm not sure what I should do. I have earned the right to make $100,000 a year at a law firm. I have earned the right based on my academic performance, to clerk for the Supreme Court. But I made a promise to people in the city of Chicago that if I got a Harvard Law degree, I would come back and serve them as a community organizer. Can I give up the $100,000? Can I give up the clerkship on the Supreme Court and do what I promised the people I would do? As we sat there just before he graduated in 1991, I said, Barack, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Have you heard that before? Have you heard Barack ever give me credit for saying yes, you can? I'm not mad at him. I'm not. I'm not. Mad, I'm not. You know. I'm not. Mad. But but the point of that that the, the whole notion of empowering people is what he has done, uh, and let me tell you why it's important as a matter of diversity. Now. Uh, he ran a campaign about diversity. Uh, and if you go back to his remarkable speech in July 2004 in Boston at the Democratic National Convention, he said some things that were quite unique. He said then, this is not about the red states or about the blue states. It's about the United States. He talked about bringing together people who were as diverse as day and night. The whole idea, he, it wasn't the Democratic platform, it was Barack's platform that if we're going to serve, we have to serve all the people. That has been his consistent message from the moment he started in politics. Uh, he had that same message when he was a state, uh, when a U.S. senator and a state senator. And when he ran for president, it was clear that was the same message as well throughout his campaign in terms of what was important to him. But what has he done and why is diversity important to him? Think about it because we don't really focus on the uh, remarkable, unprecedented things that he has done. What was the first piece of legislation he signed? It, Lilly Ledbetter, right? Equality of payment for work performed by women. And what was the first uh, important appointment he made? It was Hillary Clinton as the Secretary of State, the person that he had fought with in a bitter campaign, but he had the sense that diversity means I want the best and the brightest. Democrats were upset, Obama supporters were upset, Clinton supporters were upset, but he says, I know what I want, I want the best. 
And the best comes in all shapes and sizes. What did he do? A little known fact, except in the legal community, he appointed and nominated Elena Kagan to be the Solicitor General. Now, people said, well, there are a lot of Solicitor Generals. There have never in the history of our society ever been a woman. Over 50% of our profession, law, is women. Professors, deans, university presidents, and yet not a single one had ever served as Solicitor General. That was historic. No other president had thought or had the, 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 the perspective that a woman could be and should be the nation's top lawyer. He did. The president appointed Eric Holder as the first African-American attorney general. It's not just that he appointed him, but diversity goes further. Eric's parents are Jamaican immigrants. He went to Columbia. And so the whole idea was that he's not just appointing Eric, but he's recognizing he's bringing a larger community together that makes an enormous amount of difference. No other president in the history of our society has appointed two women to the Supreme Court in two years. Women are 51% of the profession, and now they're a third, an unprecedented third of our court. And he's not finished yet. And what's really remarkable, uh, if you start thinking about it, if you look at every major circuit around the country, as a lawyer, I'm telling you this, that he's appointed uh, people of color from the West Coast to the East Coast, from the South to the Midwest, to circuit courts. Why? Because those people are one heartbeat away from the Supreme Court. They, he may not be around. He certainly may not be present when they have the chance. But think about his sense of why diversity matters. It matters because it determines uh, all the issues that are important to us in very uh, classic ways. We have been fighting over and over uh, how do we survive and, and support HBCUs. He didn't go to an HBCU, a historically black college university, but he's given more money uh, uh, to HBCUs than any president in the history of this country because he realizes the vital service that historically black colleges and universities serve in our community, and that is uh, an affirmation uh, of what it means. Uh, he has also uh, not only walked the walk, but talked the talk about diversity and how important it is in our society. Uh, and he's learned the lessons uh, of diversity in ways that uh, perhaps most, most people don't appreciate. He's avoided the usual template that's used. What is the usual template of diversity that we have to avoid? It's simply this. There are far too many people who have two different models of diversity, uh, and neither model is acceptable. One model is that we tried it, and it didn't work. <laughs> we tried it. We had one, and she or he didn't work out. That's the model. Not to talk about all the other people who were part of that hiring process who never get a chance. Or the other model. We can't find one like her. She was the best. There are no more like her, right? The good minority and the bad minority. That's, that's the two extremes. And what they do, what the president's never done, is this. I'm not sure if I can appoint her because she's a woman and a minority. Which do I count? You count them both, <laughs> right? And the, I, I, you know, how do I weigh it? I don't know how to weigh the race and ethnicity as opposed to the gender. You weigh them both. You're giving something special. And that's what this president sees that has been lost in our dialogue. He also has had the difficult conversations about race. Uh, when President Clinton in the 1990s talked about One America and appointed John Hope Franklin as the head of the committee, I made a point then that's just as relevant to President Obama today. And that point was this about diversity. If you're going to talk about race, you have to agree to be surgical. Now, what do I mean by that? Race is not rocket science. It's harder than that. It's the most difficult conversation we have. How do we know that? Every single time the president has stumbled on the issue of race, it has set him back. It's never been something that's gone forward with the sort of exception of Philadelphia speech, but that's an exception. I'll talk about it later. And so I said, when President Clinton talked about let's bring the country together, I said, you have to be surgical. If you're going to open us up, all of us, to give our honest, candid views about discrimination, 
about race, about bias, you have to be prepared to heal us. You can't open us up and leave that wound untreated. You can't have a dialogue in a beer or, or a Kool-Aid or, or a Chardonnay <laughs> summit, right? You have to have that ongoing difficult conversation. And he understands that. And that's why it's, it's avoided. But what he's told us when we talk about diversity is that it's up to us. We can't expect the president to pronounce what it means to be diverse. We have to, as he said from the beginning, make it happen from the ground up. And he says, I've done mine. Look at my appointments. Look at my agenda. Look at my priorities. Uh, and you, whether, whether you call me black or brown or white or whatever you call me, the reality is that diversity is essential to what I do. And that's been his life's uh, issue and his life's uh, focus for uh, uh, all of these uh, 49 years. I want to also bring it to uh, uh, and talk a little bit, because a lot of you are interested in about the, the case of uh, Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Uh, and, and the President uh, had some diverse issues in that one as well that I'll talk about in a second. And, and let me talk about why it, it matters and, think, and what he tried to do with the issue of race. The book says this, the book, title of the book is The Presumption of Guilt, and everybody in here, whether you're a lawyer or a judge or have no contact with the legal profession, you know there's no such thing as the presumption of guilt. That's not a legal concept. It's called the presumption of innocence. The title is to make you think, do we presume people are guilty because of their race, what they wear, where they shop, where they live, what they drive? Uh, or, are there presumptions, and can we overcome them? In the Gates case, uh, the subtitle was the, the, the arrest of Henry Louis Gates and race, class, and crime in America. We don't talk about class, which is the eyesore in our system. It was the eyesore on July 16, 2009 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Why is this important? It's more than a year ago, and, and Professor Gates is a well-known scholar just returned from China, going to the home of Yo-Yo Ma, meeting some of his ancestors, talking about, th uh, some of his relatives, talking about 13th century history. He arrived at his house, couldn't get in his door uh, with his driver, uh, it was jammed, he pushed it open uh, with the help of the driver, got in, driver took two pieces of luggage in the house, got his tip, drove the limousine and headed out. Gates called the Harvard real estate and said, uh, I'm here, my door was jammed, I, I had to force my way in, I don't want to sleep here in the house with a broken door, can send someone repaired right away. And they said, yes, Mr. Gates, we'll have someone in 15 minutes. He's regaling them about China and his trip to yo yo Ma's home and et cetera on the phone, and he looks and he says, wow, the repair guy's here already. <laughs> she said, no, Mr. Gates, not yet, it'll take another 10 minutes. And he walks to his door and what does he see? He sees a police officer with, in uniform with a badge and a gun. And the officer says this, step outside, step outside now. He said, excuse me, step outside now. And Gates says, I live here. He said, step outside now. And Gates said this, no, I will not. I live here. And the officer didn't know what was going on because there aren't a whole lot of burglars, as I know, who walk around with a cell phone in the house of the person <laughs> they did the burglar. Right? But that's another, that's in the record, right? And Gates says, I have ID, and let me show your ID. He goes to a table, the officer comes in the house, Gates shows him his wallet with plastic, you can see through it. The top is his Harvard ID, with his photograph and his name, Henry Louis Gates Jr., photograph, officer, Harvard University, clear. Shows him his driver's license, Henry Louis Gates Jr., 17 Ware Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts, driver's license. Now, Gates showed him the Harvard ID first. I don't know why, but he did, right? He showed him the Harvard ID, but he showed ID. That's what you don't know. He showed him ID. This is who I am. It didn't end there. And so Gates says, if you don't believe me, call the chief. Call the chief of the Harvard University police. They know me. Gates was a friend of police. He loved police. Police did their job. They locked up the criminals. The Capas never had safe. His car wasn't stolen. He could eat in a restaurant and not be bothered by trespassers. He loved police. And they knew him. And yet he's identified himself in his house. And Sergeant Crowley, who was a good guy, grew up in Cambridge, played uh, uh, football and wrestled there, was highly regarded by the African-American coach. Uh, his father and his brother were police officers. Uh, he went to the same public school that my children attended. 
uh, was known as a good officer, and, and yet here he is coming to investigate what he's heard was a brick and, and, and entering, and he encounters Gates. Uh, and then there's a hero in all of this, and who's the hero? Not who you think. The, everyone said the day, after, the day after there's a woman, a nosy neighbor who called the police. Well, that's not true. This woman was the hero, and I talk about it in the book. Her name is Lucia Whalen. And what does she say? Uh, she is walking from her job at the Harvard uh, Magazine across the street on, on uh, Ware Street, and another woman says, I think they're breaking in, call the police, I don't have a phone. She takes her cell phone, she calls the police. What does she say when she calls the police? Uh, she says, uh, I'm here, uh, uh, I'm told that this woman sees two gentlemen trying to enter the house. Uh, she says, uh, I, I can see what they're doing, but here's what she says, there's no presumption. She says. I'm not sure if these are two individuals who actually work there or live there. No presumption at all. I'm not sure if they work there or live there. I'm just reporting what I see, right? And the dispatcher says to his credit, well, are they white, black, or Hispanic? Give me, all right, well, they're white, black, or Hispanic? And she says, well, one's Hispanic, uh, and I'm not sure about the other one. That's what she says. So this woman in no way uh, implicates Professor Gates in a burglary of his own house. She doesn't. The officer comes to the scene, goes to the house, and says he's uh, talking to Gates. And he says he talks to the eyewitness. And here's what he says uh, in his conversations with her. He says, Waylon, who was standing on the sidewalk in front of the residence, true, held a wireless telephone in her hand, true, and told me that it was she who called police, true. She went on to tell me that she observed what appeared to be two black males with backpacks on the porch. She never said that. Never mentioned race, never mentioned backpacks, right? But it gets worse, and that's why these issues become important. And then, uh, officer puts in his, in his report, well, I tell Gates, uh, I, I, I call the, the Harvard University police to tell them to come, et cetera. And Gates says, well, and here's what Gates says. Gates is looking for him, he gave the ID, waiting. Well, uh, why are you here? Tell me why you're here. And Gates says these things. Do you know who I am? Do you know who you're messing with? Mm -hmm. Those are all about class, not about race. What he's saying, do you know who I am? I'm not the kid who was born 58 years ago in West Virginia in segregation. I'm a university professor. Uh, I, am, uh, one of the, I am a brilliant scholar. Uh, I've received a MacArthur Genius Award. Uh, he, I mean, he, that's what he's thinking. Do you know who I am? Do you know who you're messing with? I'm a man of substance. I've earned the right to be respected for who I am. And, he, it, and everything he said was protected. You may not like it, but all of us protected. And then Gates is really upset when the officer says nothing to him. Won't dismiss, he says this. He says, I'm going to file a complaint. I want your name and your badge number. That's what he said. He had a right to say that. I have been teaching for 25 years, and I tell my students in criminal law procedure, never, ever, 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 ever tell a police officer you're going to file a complaint, number one, <laughs> and never ask for his or her name and badge number. It's on their chest. Their name's on one side, the badge number's on the other side. And then you can uh, do what you need to do. Obviously, Professor Gates did not take my class. I, that's fine. I'm, I'm not mad at him, right? Uh, but, but you see the problem building here. And what it is is a testosterone problem. There are two people. Neither wants to give ground. Uh, and one has the power. The power of what? The power of arrest, right? And he says in his report, the acoustics were so bad, I kept telling Gates that I would talk to him later. Uh, I gave him my badge and ID, but why would Gates keep asking for it if he gave him his name and his badge? Why would he keep asking for it? And I told Gates that if he wanted to talk to me, he'd have to do so outside. Why? It's no crime if Gates yells at him, shouts at him, disagrees with him all day long in his private residence. It's not a crime. It's not a crime. But once he goes out, as he did, uh, and sees these Harvard police, tries to get their attention, it, it then becomes a public issue and the officer arrested him. Now, why is that important? It's important because we didn't know these facts uh, on July 16, 2009. He was arrested, uh, taken to the station. I went to see him, uh, uh, became his lawyer. And I said one thing to him that people appreciate as lawyers to clients. I said, Skip, promise me 
that you won't say a single word because I don't want to change the facts. I don't think this is a legitimate charge. I think we can get the charges dismissed. He said, okay. And none of you in the world knew that he was arrested on Thursday, July 16th, the same day President Obama was given a phenomenal speech in New York for the 100th anniversary of the NAACP. Nobody knew it. It wasn't in the news. Not on Thursday or Friday or Saturday or Sunday. On Monday, we had the charges dismissed. And on Tuesday, it became a national issue. That's when you heard. So he was quiet after the charges were dismissed. And, and I, thought, I thought it was over. It was great. And on Tuesday, I'm sitting there buying my own business, and I get a call. Uh, it says, uh, Press Ogletree, this is the New York Times. One of you wanted to comment on your client's comments about his arrest. I said, hold on, click. <laughs> Skip, did you talk to the New York Times about your arrest? We just got dismissed. No, 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 Tree, I just gave them background information. I didn't talk to them, I just gave them background. <laughs> hold on, click, right? And so that became the first problem. You know, Skip, you can't have, even after it's dismissed, if you want to do something, do not go and talk about rogue police and a billion dollar lawsuit and, uh, you know, this always happens to a black man in America. That, you know, it doesn't even sound like Skip, right? It doesn't even sound like Skip, right? And so we get that settled. And then his daughter uh, writes in the uh, Daily uh, Beast an article called An Interview uh, with My Dad, the Jailbird. I said, Skip, did you give your daughter an interview? Tree, I was just talking to Lila. I wasn't, I wasn't giving her an interview. I, was, I said, Skip, I'm reading here 10 pages. Question, answer, question, answer. Qu oh, OK, I got it, right? And we think it's fine. It's over, right? It, it's done. And then uh, the brilliant diversity man, uh, President Obama is on a roll in health care. A great press conference on July 22nd. Talked about the public option, talked about the votes in the Senate, talked about uh, more health care for more communities that never had it before, talked about his universal application in some respects. The very last question from Lynn Sweet from Chicago. Mr. President, you have any comments on the arrest of Henry Louis Gates, Jr.? And he said, well, first, Henry Louis Gates Jr. is my friend. Second, I, I don't know all the facts. You said he should have been quiet then? I didn't say that. I didn't say that, right? <laughs> right? But then he said, the third thing was, the Cambridge police acted stupidly. Yeah. See, there you you just like the rest of them. That's not all he said. When you arrest a man in his own house after he gives ID. But all the public heard was the Cambridge police acted stupidly. And I say in the book, that blackened him. What do I mean by that? He was no longer the president of the United States. He was the black president defending his black friend, both with Harvard connections, against the hardworking white police officer. The class and race issue came together. And it was a mess. Glenn Beck said he was a racist and didn't like white people right after that. <laughs> Right, and we didn't know Glenn Beck much in '09. We know him well now. Right, he, he, he's he's up and rising. Uh, and this, the last thing he said that people may forget, he said that that th there's a history of African American and Latinos being subjects of racial profiling. And as a state senator in Illinois, I supported legislation to deal with racial profiling. I'm getting calls from folks. Tree, did you hear your boy? What? What? Did you hear your boy? The president said there's a problem of racial profiling in America. Black people were. Uh, elated that he recognized it was a problem, publicly so. Uh, but you can imagine health care went off the agenda, yeah. completely off the agenda, right? Uh, and it didn't come back on until he said, uh, we're going to have a beer summit, right? Uh, and, and so he had this beer summit with the guys. And I want you, when you look at the book, uh, there's a classic photograph in the book. You can't see it from here, but it's a kumbaya moment, <laughs> right? Two black guys, two white guys having a beer in the Rose Garden in white. What could be more American? We've solved the problems, right? Now, the backstory here is that uh, it was supposed to be between Gates uh, and Sergeant Crowley uh, and the president. The president, talking about good judgment, it invited Biden, right? Said, Joe, come on out, right? Uh, and if you look at this very closely, there are four mugs, only one has not been drinking. That's Joe Biden. Joe Biden doesn't drink anything, not even non-alcoholic beer. And so we get this nasty photo. It's all done. Wrap it up. It's gone, right? You see that photo? And then the press leaves, and the president says, uh, Joe, go back inside and entertain Ogletree and the other guys. What? 
kicks Joe Biden out of the, the conversation. Now, why do you think this president decided to tell Joe Biden not to stay in the conversation? Can you imagine what Joe Biden might have said <laughs> to Crowley and Gates? Can you imagine? Right? And so the president, it's clean, it's over, it's done, let's move on, right? And that's what happens. But, but he understood that, that, that the reality is that that challenged his agenda. And, and, and the reality is that it hasn't been the same since. And we can't have the conversation that we need on diversity. We can't. Because the president can't have a conversation on race without people seeing his race as a factor in his judgment. But who is in a better position to talk about race than someone who uh, is the uh, son of a white mother from Kansas uh, and an African father from Kenya and who has had the most diverse experience of, of traveling around the world? He knows what diversity means and should have the chance to talk about it, but he has not had that opportunity. And that's too bad, which means that we have to do it. We can't expect him to do it. He commented about uh, the uh, cultural center uh, on Ground uh, Zero in New York. It blew up race and religion. Shirley Sherrod uh, being asked to pull over and text her resignation to the office. Race again, uh, can't talk about it. It is, it is the divisive, the brutal, uh, the ugly issue. And so uh, in the book, what I try to talk about is how these issues matter. I talk about the problem at Harvard uh, with, with diversity. Diversity has its virtues and its vices. It's great to have a more diverse uh, faculty and student body, but it doesn't mean that you don't eliminate your other problems. My colleague, Alan Counter, an esteemed scientist, an award-winning scientist, uh, is stopped in Harvard Yard where he works because the police thinks he is a, sub, a suspect in a robbery in Harvard Square. He's rescued uh, not by the police, but by other students who say, that's our professor. He's not criminal. Uh, and he, he's wearing a Brooks Brothers suit. And they say, well, uh, criminals wear a Brooks Brothers suit, right? The, he's released. No charges are brought. The university apologizes. Uh, and other individuals apologize. The police never apologize. Right? The cost of diversity. Students at Harvard find themselves uh, there. They've earned their way there. And then they stop by police. Uh, and they're questioned. And, and they try to say, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm an award-winning college graduate. I'm here at Harvard Law School. They get stopped and questioned, well, you look like a suspect in a robbery. We didn't do it. Of course, there's no charges brought. But for them, it's the cost of diversity. That any diversity, that is, they, they all look alike. Right? And the other point that I write in the book, which is a controversial one, we can't dress up diversity. That is, we can't have the Ogletree Ozan ex exception. If we wear suits and ties, we're okay. But if we're wearing jeans uh, and sweatpants, we're not okay. We can't have that. We can't have a look that fits. There's a cost of diversity, and the cost is that we have to sort it out and not be presumptive uh, about who's uh, a criminal and who isn't based on the color of their skin or what they wear. That's not uh, good police work. That's not the kind of work that we need. And finally, let me say this. The book talks about that. It talks about the Rodney King case, the lessons we didn't learn. Uh, and, and, and that I wrote a book uh, in 1994 about the Rodney King case at the request of Dr. Benjamin Hooks, who was the head of the NAACP, about the findings. The book was called Beyond the Rodney King Story, an investigation of police conduct in minority communities. Here's how we solve the problem. It was a book full of ideas about diversity in law enforcement, community involvement, things that make the problem better. It was a brilliant book. None of you bought it. <laughs> Nobody. I know you didn't buy it, right? I've got all the remainder copies, 59 cents. You didn't buy it, right? I'm not mad at you. It's in this one. Because we didn't learn our lesson 16 years ago, we're repeating the same thing again. We're recognizing people's talents and not judging a person by their skin color or their dialect, but by the content of character, as Dr. King told us uh, more than 40 years ago. And I talk about those cases here. The last chapter in the book is called 100 Ways of Looking at a Black Man. Why, after Gates' arrest, I received all these emails, text messages, calls, letters uh, from people 
uh, my son, daughter, nephew, aunt, grandfather, uh, niece, brother had a case like this. It was across the country, across the world, really. And that was very helpful. But ironically, when you talk about diversity, who wrote me the most and called me the most? Professional black men saying, Tree, this happened to me. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't file a lawsuit. Think about it, that's the cost of diversity. You've got to uh, uh, go along to get along. You can't rock the boat. And I talk about Ellis Coles' book, the, the Rage of the Black Middle Class, the oh, oh idea, you know, when have I earned the right to be respected for when I am? I'm not sure we will ever get there. And I say that, I'm not sure we ever, and I'm not sure we should. That's the controversial, I'm not sure we should create an exception, a class exception of acceptable professional people of color who are treated differently because they're professional people of color. Because it's gonna be us against them and we are them. And I talk about that. And so you'll see that from Thurgood Marshall to John Hope Franklin to Johnny Cochran uh, to uh, Vernon Jordan to Spike Lee to, uh, to uh, the, um, Eric Holder, our attorney general talking about when he was a student at Columbia being pulled over, police thought he had weapons in his car. He let them search, he didn't have any. And he says uh, the Gates arrest reminded him of what he went through as a college and he'd forgotten about it. And the final two cases of this, my dear friend Johnny Cochran's a great, great lawyer. We know him from O.J. Simpson, from Michael Jackson, from P. Diddy and all these other cases, but he also was a prosecutor before. He was a, a great criminal defense lawyer and civil rights lawyer. And in 1980, I say Johnny made two mistakes. And I've, uh, bear with me now. The first mistake Johnny made in 1980 was he bought a Rolls Royce. Now, I'm not mad at him. That's fine. The second mistake is he drove it on the L.A. highways, right? <laughs> and he was pulled over, and the police put a gun on him. And Johnny said, put the gun down. My kids are in the back seat. Here's my driver's license. Here's my badge as a district attorney. And what did the police say? Oh, we're sorry, Mr. Cochran. We didn't know it was you. That's the class issue. If we knew it were you, were you, it wouldn't happen. But if it's anybody else driving a Rolls Royce on the highway, that's a different, you know, we can create, we don't want the exception. And finally, Prince Chamel is a friend of mine, graduated from Harvard a few years before we did, uh, grew up in Alabama, uh, senior partner in a, uh, a law firm in Memphis. About a year ago, he's in the book, about a year ago he was cutting his grass uh, with his khakis on and an old sports shirt. Uh, and an elderly white woman drove by and saw him and said, hey sir, uh, uh, how much do you charge to cut the grass? And Prince uh, had a Carl Rowan moment. He says, ma'am, I don't charge anything to cut the grass. <laughs> but I do sleep with the woman of the house. She said, wow, she hit the gas and ran, uh, right? Here's the problem with that. Here's the problem. Prince, Prince didn't say, do you know who I am? I'm a lawyer, I own the spacious house. He didn't do any of that, right? The problem is that that woman drove off really thinking, I have to sleep with this guy to cut the grass, right? So it, it, the lesson wasn't learned, right? And so the purpose of the book is to say, it's not for Skip Gates. He, could, he, he said that day, call Tree. That's all he said in, 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 this, in that police car. Call Tree. That's all he had to say. People like us can call a lawyer. But the reality is most of the people that are in the system don't have that luxury, don't have that ability. And the book is, a, are we presuming them guilty without knowing the facts of what's happening? And that's another aspect of, the, the, let me end here, the, the issue of, of, of diversity. And that is that we have an abiding sense about helping out and, and we have not been able to do that the way that we should, uh, particularly with our young people. One of the great lessons of writing this book is that uh, my, dog, my, my wife taught me about the importance of diversity. My wife, Pam, is the president and CEO of an organization called Children's Services of Roxbury. She has a program called YPP, the Youth to Police Partnership. What are they doing? They're doing, in a sense, what I recommended decades ago. That is, you have to partner with police. Police are not our enemy. 
They're there to protect and to serve everybody. This is not a condemnation. of They're, they're condemned nowhere in this book. That's not my point. The point is how do we make them better? And what these young people do, Hispanic and Latinos, is that uh, Hispanic and African Americans, they meet with the police and learn what they do. They may not become police officers, but they understand it. When the police officers roll up on them, they'll see, oh, that's Jamal. I know him. He's in our program. I don't want the Jamal exception, but I want the sense that let's make diversity a reality so that we don't look at people and know who they are. Let's make this community friendly so that people will come and not say, well, I, I'm not wanted on that campus because I don't look right. I don't sound right. I don't dress right. Where is there more opportunity for diversity of ideas and thoughts uh, and exchange of ideas than on a university campus? Uh, and as Case Western thinks about that, it seems to me that uh, you have to look in East Cleveland. You, you have to look in places. Uh, the work you have to do is harder than expected. If there's no child being born today in East Cleveland who will be able to attend this university in 18 years, the system is broken. It's not that child's fault. And it's not Case Western's fault either. It means that we have failed by labeling folks based on region uh, without realizing that people will learn as much as we teach them and they won't learn what we don't offer them the, the incentives to, to, to improve upon. And so keep in mind, diversity is not rocket science. It's harder than that. Diversity involves everybody. Diversity is not a project. It, it is a goal. And you keep measuring yourself by how much you achieve that goal. And uh, diversity is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And diversity is not achieved by appointing someone. It's achieved when your team looks like the country looks and no one even notices because diversity is a crystallized part of it, not an exception, it's the rule. That's what we need to have. Uh, and as we think about what it means uh, in the 21st century, uh, I'll be back. And, and, and I have to say this, the last thing, there is no more diverse state. I've traveled for the president all over the country. Ohio uh, is schizophrenic to try to cover in politics. Cleveland is not Cincinnati. <laughs> Cincinnati is not Columbus. Columbus is not Toledo. Toledo's not Dayton. Dayton is not Lima, right? And I've said, I'm in different countries uh, <laughs> traveling through this, right? I really am. I mean, and, and, and you, the dialogue has to be different because within one state, the great thing about it, this is the United States. It really is, you think about it, if you think about how diverse your cities are, it is a remarkable example of diversity and the challenges that we have. The people are proud to be from Cleveland, proud to be from Columbus, proud to be from uh, Lima, proud to be uh, from Cincinnati, but they're all different. And if we can't figure that out, we can't figure the bigger problem out, right? It, it's, it really is a challenge. So I will be back here uh, uh, after November 3rd uh, here in Ohio, uh, in Cleveland, Columbus, uh, Cincinnati, Toledo, Dayton, Lima, uh, because it's the bellwether. And if, if, it, if it's going to work anywhere in the world, think about it. If, if the idea of different people working together to achieve a common goal is going to work anywhere in the world, Ohio's ground zero. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ogletree. That was absolutely wonderful. I don't know how many of you know this song, but there's a song that says, if my brother is in trouble, so am I. Um, the line that goes with it is, if my sister is in trouble, so am I. And so I just appreciate that this book what you just said today is giving us an opportunity to think about these ideas. I just have one little announcement. We are um, pleased that you were here today because we took advantage of your being here in more than one way. We have a new social justice initiative that grew out of our alliance initiative that uh, Provost Bazelak started. And Rhonda Williams is here, who's head of our new Social Justice Institute. And I encourage all of you to come back. We do believe it is more than dialogue. 
And so because we believe it is more than dialogue, we're following up uh, next month, November 19th and 20th, for our race relations think tank. So we hope you'll come back and, and be with us for that event. But uh, now I'd like to give you an opportunity to ask the professor questions. People know that I love to talk, but this is not my moment. This is your moment to talk to him. And so if you have uh, a question for Professor Ogletree, this is uh, an opportunity for you to do it. Oh, but first I get to give him a gift. <laughs> We are so happy you are here today, and we know that there's a, a piece of paper that you will get for coming. But this is a gift. This, there's a T-shirt in here. I don't know if you wear cufflinks. I hope you do. I do. Okay, excellent. So these are some Case Western cufflinks in here, and we just want you to know that we appreciate you, not just for being a celebrity, but because you are helping us think about the issues that matter. We know diversity matters. We know inclusive excellence matters. And you've helped us think about that today and get busy to doing the work. So we thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Do we need a microphone or no? I think I'm loud enough. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you again for coming. And I'm one of those um, stories that you talked about. Ah. I grew up in East Cleveland, went to the University of Cincinnati, and obtained my master's from here at Case West Reserve. So I am living proof that it happens. Um, <laughs> and my question to you is what do we need to do as, as members of the community to do our part to help Case Western Reserve continue to have those opportunities to help the little girl in East Cleveland or the little boy in Cleveland know that it's, it's an opportunity for them to become a graduate of Case Western Reserve and go on to get their law degree and those sorts of things. That's a perfect question. It's a perfect setup. Where is Dr. Williams? Is she here? Right? Stand up. Uh, here's who you need to meet. Uh, Dr. Williams has a phenomenal program that they're starting to social justice. And I talked to her and her team today as part of my meeting here. And the idea is to make the community connections. Uh, they want people to be on this campus. They want to meet the clergy. They want to meet the entrepreneurs. They want business to say, we have to invest it. The children uh, is a concern for all of us. And we know if you don't do something now, uh, we can't expect results down the road. And so I, I hope you guys will talk before you leave because you, you, you can get her in the community, right? She needs you to say, yeah, I grew up there. You don't say you're going to fail just because you're from East Cleveland. I have succeeded, and I can I tell you a thousand other people have succeeded. But we need to talk to young people and make that happen. We need to also, are there any clergy here? Good. We, we need to talk to you, too. That were great. Perfect. Right? Because that's the other point. The, the, the heart of the community is the clergy, right? That's where the people come through that door. And we need to, and, and the president, the dean, uh, and certainly Dr. Williams wants to open this up and make it possible. And we need that the, the clergy to say, this is a place that's friendly. Because folks are going to say, I'm not going to the university. They got all those doors and bars, et cetera. They don't accept me. But the reality is that it's an open university. It's an inviting university. Their programs here are phenomenal. We should know about it. Uh, and I think that's a good example. And there, I, I'm not going to ask uh, who are the millionaires here. You can keep your hands down. <laughs> but, but we're looking for the millionaires to support it because it's, it's in your interest, right? Because when you support programs that involve and include more people, promote more diversity, you pay fewer property taxes. There's less crime. There's more employment. There's better health. Uh, there's better diet. Uh, there's better education. It works. It works. Uh, and we have to start talking about that. And Dr. Williams and I talked about that about, uh, let me just give you one example. And this is, uh, it, I don't want anybody to raise their hands. I, I know uh, Dr. Mobley's heard this and she would raise her hands. But how many of us, don't raise your hands, how many of us start uh, reading to our children when they're born? Not when they're five, when they're born. The answer is not enough, right? We say, oh, they're going to school. But no, no, but, but, but the, you would see a discernible difference between the people who say, I'm going to teach my child to read by reading to her right now. She's two. She may not get it. The things that we can do in our own control, but, but parents in East Cleveland may not know that. We know it, right, because we know it's made a difference. When my wife was reading to our kids, I said, they can't understand. She said, yes, they can. She wins every argument, <laughs> right? My answer is always, yes, dear, right? And in fact, it, it, you know, they began to notice when dad, tired and overworked, 
skip the page. No, 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 go back, go back. We're, we're, you know, read that. You know, how many times have I read Over the Moon? A, a thousand times. And I'm reading to my granddaughters, right? And so the, the, the reality is that making the connections is very important. We can do some of these things that make an enormous amount of difference, uh, and we can uh, start to make that uh, uh, go forward. Next question. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, what about the, where are we at with uh, you mentioned earlier about the uh, uh, um, Mr. Stokes and the uh, Terry case and Matt versus Ohio, and also uh, we've had two cases here in Solar and Pepper Pike where there was racial profiling. Where are we at with the uh, 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 stop and frisk? Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's been a large settlements in the NYPD in terms of stop mm -hmm. and frisk and what have you, relevant to the Gates case. Uh, the uh, thing with uh, Terry, where are we at here right now with that? I actually talk about a number of the cases uh, where there have been uh, judgments against uh, police. People may not know, like in the uh, Oscar Grant case. Oscar Grant was a young African-American in Oakland in the subway who was shot on January 2009 and killed uh, by a police officer. Before the case went to trial, his daughter, surviving daughter, received a uh, one and a half million dollars in settlement already before there's a trial. Uh, the officer was convicted, uh, and Johnny Burroughs, a good friend of mine uh, who worked with Johnny Cochran, has brought the lawsuit uh, for damages for all the people who were involved as well. Uh, in New Jersey, one of Johnny's last cases, uh, a major racial profiling case, is two African American, two Latinos were run off the street by the New Jersey police, uh, and, and a couple of them were shot, no one uh, seriously wounded. Uh, and they won a $16.5 million judgment against them uh, in that case. So there are some successes. Uh, Abner Luima won a sizable settlement for his uh, assault in New York. But the reality is that uh, in too many of the cases I talk about, the solution is twofold. One, it's very hard to win these cases. Let's not be foolish. They're very hard to win, number one. Uh, and um, uh, in my sense is that we've got to do a couple of things, change police practices so they're not profiling so that they have facts, not rental car, black person, interstate, that's enough. What's the indicia of crime, number one? And number two, those of us in positions, like the many of the people I profile in the book, you have to take some action. You can't, and, and you know what's interesting? Almost every person in this book said, all I wanted was an apology. Very interesting. Not money, <coughs> not, I want an apology. And, and, which means sometimes these things, uh, the police are, get a call and they respond. And I heard about the case you're talking about, is Piper, what's that town? Pepper, Pepper Pike. Pike. <clears throat> and it's interesting, whatever happened in that case, it seems to me that without knowing all the facts, I talked to some uh, plain dealer reporters today, it's interesting because all you're getting is the report on what happened, where's the dialogue? Because it's almost as if it's, it's not just between one family that made the call and one family whose son was arrested, it's with the whole community, right? It's the whole community. If the thinking is uh, a black kid trying to sell something uh, for a fundraiser uh, is turned into a suspect uh, and uh, carrying a gun, there's something wrong with that. And it's not just the police. Don't blame the police. There's something wrong with the, the, thinking about how the call's made, why it's made, and what sort of uh, information do you need to know uh, more about the, the community beyond your, uh, where you live? Uh, and that's, a, that's actually, when I say a good case study, I'm not talking about an ac academic issue, but how, how do we keep this from happening again? And the reality is that families that live there need to know that we live in a diverse world. We live in a diverse uh, suburban Cleveland. And not everyone who comes to your door, or walks in your neighborhood, or drives through is a criminal. Uh, in fact, it's probably more the exception than the rule, uh, and but we we need to break that down. And not not and here's here's the po final point. It doesn't help to call people racist, because it shuts off the dialogue. Right? There are people who have unconscious biases that they don't even know. They don't even know, right? Uh, and uh, and that that's part of it. You, you have to get into that because some people are afraid to talk because they think you're going to call them a racist rather than somebody who lacks the understanding. Because it's not that they don't want to be around diverse people, they just haven't been around diverse people. And how do we make that happen in some way that makes an enormous amount of difference? We should not be separated in communities, and that has to be our challenge. How many more questions? Okay, we can only take one more question because Professor Ogletree would like to sign a few books. 
before his friend takes him to the airport. So I'm going to tell you, we have one more question, and then if he's going to be in line, maybe he'll be able to sign for you. And you can so call on be, the person. It has to be on a, it has to be a very concise question. It can't be sprawling. So, all right? Your hand is up. I'll take it. Thank you. How are you? Ah, good. Thank you. Uh, and when during political time, people get very up, uh, about law and order. What can we do as community, bring people together? I do appreciate the graduating from BU. Now I live in the inner city and I work as a community activist. I just saw yesterday some brothers walking through the community. Police swept in. We got them lined up against the fences. Some of one was a kid that my daughter recognized when we went to high school. So what can we do as a community to bring people together? And not just during political times. Talk about law and order and really make a difference people's lives who may not be able to, as you say, hire a lawyer like you. It's, it's actually a great uh, question, and, 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 and here's a simple and quick answer. Uh, I think that what uh, my wife's organization has, the Youth to Police Partnership, is very important. I think corporate America should engage in talking about the community to police partnership. We want police to protect us. We want to be safe. We also want to avoid profiling, and that means dialogue. It means it's going to be some nasty dialogue, and so it means I'm not going to see you when someone's shot and beat and stabbed. I want to talk to you before the problem happens, so I want you to understand me. I don't want you to know here are the eight people who can walk the streets, they're okay, but I want you to understand that maybe the problem is the kids are walking the streets, they don't have a job, they don't have an after-school program, they don't have transportation. And, and the simple answer, and let me tell you the, the, the complicated, I'm talking about Boston, I'm not talking about Cleveland the complicated race dimension. Think of, I, I, I'll change the facts a little bit, make this sort of hypothetical. Grandmother living in public housing, eighth floor, looks down, sees uh, six young teenage black men sitting around the stoop. No drugs, no guns, but she fears that if I walk through them, I might be harassed. What does she do? There's some kids outside my stoop selling drugs, right? 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 Her point is that she knows, that, but she, she knows ki black kids selling drugs, the police will come, right? And then the kids will have an attitude. The gates, do you know who I am? Yeah, you're the black kid selling drugs. I'm not, right? And so that's, that's what we have to deal with, how we have to figure out how do we and create a better community. And those kids are sitting there because they don't, you know, we haven't given them anything. They're not sitting there because they want, they, they don't have money in their pockets. They have nothing, nothing. It's, it's, it's 88 degrees on a July day. The, the air conditioning's not working. All they do is sitting out because it's the only place they can survive. And mom says, get out the house, boy, get out the house, right? Don't sit in here. And so we, the, these are achievable, fixable problems. We talked about this as well. We want the community to say, I want the kids from East Cleveland to be able to go to a museum that they haven't been before. I want them to see other parts of Ohio. I want them to pick apples in, in the fall like everybody else does. I want them to go to the hospital and know how the nurse works, how the uh, x-ray technologist works, uh, how someone who drives blo draws blood works. They might stumble on a career by just seeing people like them doing work, meaningful work, not all doctors and not all lawyers and not all dentists, and, but all the careers. We don't give our kids role models, mentors in the community and, and the police, but in the community can make that happen. And I think that makes a, an enormous amount of difference. We talked about diversity in the book, but diversity is only one principle because a lot of these issues, it doesn't matter whether the police officers are black or white or Latino. The problem still exists. It's not as if you're gonna say, hey, brother, you know, uh, it's me. Uh, excuse me, right, right? It's not that the race is gonna make a difference and meaning you'll have less profiling. And, and that's what we need is to figure out a way that we want to come, and that's these ministers are perfect. Here is what we call a safe haven. We want you to, we, we're not going to the police station. We want you to come to First Baptist, AME, Kojic. We want you to Catholic, we want you to come to our place and talk to us without your weapons, without your badges, just to sit down and talk so you can understand what, how we feel, how I feel, I have a son, I have a daughter. Uh, and hear those things, that makes an enormous amount of difference, and I need to shut up now. <laughs> All right? I, I could go on and on and on. Thank you.